Hi, everybody. My name is Ronnie Regev. I'm a product manager at RightScale. And the subject of today's conversation is around uh, gaming in the cloud, uh, some of my experiences uh, where I worked previously, and some of the tools within RightScale. You'll have to excuse me if I don't sound uh, particularly well. I'm uh, kind of sick, so uh, I'll forego any handshakes afterwards if you actually enjoy the conversation. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's get started. So welcome, right? So I'm an enterprise product manager here at RightScale, focused on large IT-oriented products and features around authentication, authorization, uh, cost aggregation, reporting, and those types of things. However, uh, my background uh, is at Ubisoft, which is, uh, for anybody who works in gaming, most people know Ubisoft, a massive game developer and publisher. I worked there for about nine years or a little bit longer, where I led the uh, online architecture and operations group for many years. So effectively, anything that ended with ubi.com ran on the infrastructure that uh, that my team either designed, built, operated, everything from data centers up until uh, working with development teams to optimize code, optimize database queries, calls, et cetera, to build the best possible games. Um, it's involved in launching uh, many, many games, some of which were successful, some of which weren't successful. Same thing with a lot of the services. Um, know a lot about launching digital right management systems that work or don't work, uh, depending on your perspective. Uh, and one of the things that I did do quite well, I'm quite happy with what I did there, was uh, pushing the notion of using infrastructure as a service across the entire organization. It originally started off uh, with a lot of resistance, and now uh, a great number of services are run out of uh, various cloud providers. Um, Amongst this, other, th other than that, I'm also an avid trekker and I'm going somewhere with this. So I like canoeing and hiking and caving and spelunking and all these things. And I'm going <laughs> to, yeah, it's a different form of caving where you actually like rappel down in caves and stuff. Uh, it's very cool and uh, a lot of fun, um, a little very dark. So uh, I'm going to start off and tell you guys a little story. So if anybody here has been on a lot of like trips or treks or stuff like that, there's a bit of a process that you need to you need to go through. So you know you you start off, you train, you get yourself into good shape, you pack your gear, you know you get all your stuff. There's good you know good equipment and waterproof everything so that if your stuff goes into the water, it'll be fine. Uh, you grab your buddies, you know, make sure everybody's ready to go, and uh, and you embark. You embark on what's going to be an epic, awesome adventure. Now, um, I've been on many trips, all of which have gone well, with one exception, which is this particular example here. All those photos are from the same trip. Uh, there's one thing that's that was missing from from all of these pictures, and that is uh, this, an actual map, right? So. <laughs> Where are we going and what are we going to do? And in this particular example, this is a trip that I took with my friends about five years ago. We spent a lot of time with um, a certain type of equipment and understanding how that worked and not enough time actually figuring out what our route was. So what ended up happening was, if you see over here on this, that left arm where it says, North Arm, we ended up about a day away from where we needed to be. And if you've ever been on a canoe camping type of trip, being a day away from where you need to be is very, very bad. Uh, so we ended up having to backtrack and lost a lot of time and we're actually lost. And the last place you want to be lost is in the Northern Canadian wilderness where it can actually be dangerous. So the, the point of this story is that in all of our excitement and stuff like that, we lost our focus on what was ultimately essential, which was our planning and so on, but it really came down to a lack of focus. We got too wrapped up in our bags and in our gear and all this stuff, and we forgot to actually, it's pretty, pretty dumb actually, it was a big mistake, but we, we forgot to actually really f maintain our focus on studying our maps. And that is the subject of the, the real theme of today's conversation, which is maintaining focus, right? So as a, as a game, as, as you know, working in the game development industry or in mobile, how do you maintain focus on what is important for your business? Right? Be it differentiating your games, be it understanding business models to help game producers uh, and your actual company succeed as much as possible. Um, I'm going to do one, I'm going to make one quick change or one uh, quick 
do one thing here, which is switch into actual presenter. I think this is presenter view, which is what I really need. No? Yes? Can you get there? All right, cool. So now I can actually see my notes. Um, right, so that is, that is a, the real theme of today's conversation. Uh, the actual agenda is, right, my experience is what, what, I, what I've done in the past at Ubisoft where I succeeded and, uh, you know, some places where I didn't quite succeed in maintaining focus for either for, for my staff, for other developers, uh, working with game producers, working with finance, et cetera, to maintain focus on what was really important, which is building really good games and launching successful games and where they weren't successful, understanding why. And then I was a RightScale customer for, uh, for many years and launched a lot of games using RightScale. So what were the tools that I'd used to uh, achieve success and what are some of the tools that exist now that didn't exist then that would have been tremendously helpful and beneficial and would have saved me, saved me a lot of time and probably actually would have helped uh, with, a lot of, uh, with a lot of the games that I worked on. So we'll start with some, uh, some tales from the past, right, in my previous life. Uh, the first one is finance can be your best friend. So uh, people don't uh, always think about this, like oh, I don't want to work with the folks in finance. Um, it's not that interesting, but in any, especially in social or mobile gaming, your cost per user is tremendously important. And if that isn't really well understood by the teams developing infrastructure or by the actual game development teams, if you don't understand what your cost is, what your costs are and what your financial objectives are, it's very difficult to, it's very difficult to actually understand what you're trying to achieve. Um, I'd spent, uh, I'd spent a lot of time on trying to understand accounting processes. My background is in, is in engineering, systems engineering and IT. I'm not a finance guy at all, but I'd spent a lot of time working with, our, with accountants and working with uh, financial controllers to really understand what were, what were they looking for. They understood how to forecast costs for, for data centers and for buying servers that need to be amortized over three years. But they didn't quite understand cloud costs. It was different. It's like all of a sudden you don't just need to pay this upfront amount of money. All of a sudden you need to understand that it is an operational expense as opposed to a capital expense. That's fine, but how do you actually budget for that? And how do you account for that over the course of the life cycle of a game? How do you go about actually paying for these services? No, no longer through a purchase order, but actually through expenses and so on. Um, the, the reason why this was helpful for me is that Having people in finance on board early with them understanding cloud and understanding infrastructure as a service and understanding all these different new services that were needed, the first time was kind of difficult. And then with each progressive game that we launched, it became easier and it became much simpler for them to understand what we were doing. And, and they didn't need to rationalize or justify these costs with every single game and say, well, why don't you just use these old servers that you have in your data center already? They understood the benefits of why we need to launch things in the cloud, and they understood the cost aspect of it. Um, so another thing is uh, you know, DevOps works, right? It's, uh, it's uh, Kim and, well, it was mentioned in our, in our survey that went out yesterday, and uh, James Staten mentioned it, and Michael Crandell mentioned it. And companies that are further along in, in working in a DevOps model have more success with cloud computing. And it's, uh, it's fairly well understood, but it's not just about deploying code quickly, right? It's about teams working together, and it's about teams working together on business objectives. And this goes back to, you know, finance can be your best friend. If you don't understand the business objectives, then it's very difficult to have teams share the same types of object objectives. So one of the things that I had done in the past was, changing performance metrics that I used to measure the performance of my team. So they went from, you know, originally it was you need to have, uh, you need to have uh, two nines availability or 99.99 .99 availability for any infrastructure that you manage, right? And that's fine, they would do whatever they needed to do. And then that switched from no drops in, no drops in concurrently connected users. Like, oh, okay, well, we can't really control that and why the, include whatever expletives you want. Why are you changing our performance objectives to that versus something that we actually have control over? Well, 
truth of the matter is if you work closely with, with your developers, with the developers, then you'll figure out ways to do continuous integration and release code or release new, ver new game builds without actually dropping users. You're like, oh, okay, well, yeah, that, that, that becomes feasible and that becomes possible. And again, the first time around, it was very difficult. The second time around, it became easier. And the third time around, the fourth time around, the folks that were in my ops teams and the architects were working closer with development architects and software architects and game level game designers because they had the same objectives. And it was an organizational change to have the same objectives across operations teams and development teams. But when you actually merge these two teams, and it is a very difficult process and it takes a lot of time, you will see success. And that is, right, it breeds success, right? You, in large organizations, there's apprehension. It's like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to try this new way of working. As you sort of move, as you move forward, right, you have one project that succeeds or you have one game that succeeds and you're able to have ops teams and dev teams that work closely together. And it becomes infectious. Right? You see other people doing well, you see other people succeeding and like, oh, I want to work like that. I don't want to have to wait for three months for procurement to deliver me something or I don't want to have to wait for provisioning time or whatever it may be. I want to use these tools that these other guys are using because they're doing things faster and they're actually working closer with development teams as opposed to having things chucked over the fence at them or having uh, code dropped and then figuring out what went well or what worked and what didn't work. Um, it's not easy to get there necessarily. Uh, none of this stuff is that easy, but uh, as you start as you start seeing some success, it'll build off itself. Uh, so these are some of the these are some of the tales from uh, from from my past of where I've seen where I've seen success. Now, a lot of that was enabled greatly by. Uh, by working with RightScale. I launched a, a great number of games with RightScale. I launched a couple of games uh, without using RightScale um, with uh, varying degrees of success. Now, um, there are a number of things within, you know, within RightScale that really um, allowed me to succeed. And going back to the original subject of this conversation, or the, the, the posted subject, which is how to build a platform for launching games, right? The first, the first part is essential, how you build your teams, how you, how you align your team's objectives to what the business's objectives are, are essential, but the, the tools that you use are also equally as important. Uh, first thing that was tremendously important was uh, using the server templates within RightScale. So there are different phases of actually using these, of using server templates, right? You have the out-of-the-box server templates. So these are either the RightScale engineered ones, and those are great for being able to give quick access to developers or give quick access to the technologies that different developers may want to try or experiment or play around with with a configuration that if you're using the right scale engineered server templates or if you're using our partner provided server templates thought has gone into how those are configured it's not just a vanilla configuration so as working on the ops side or even on the architecture side, you can very quickly look at how has this server template been designed and understand what you're giving to someone in the on the development side, be it a, you know, a, a, DBA, a dev DBA, or if it's an app server, an app dev team, or whatever it may be, you can understand very quickly what is that configuration. And that's, that's, that's great to, to start with. You can even use those configurations going forward where it becomes much more compelling. Um, is when you get into also, so you get into the, the, our, our vendor-based server templates that I mentioned before. A very good example of that is um, at a dev team that was insistent, this is uh, several years ago, that was insistent on, uh, on using Membase. And my ops team they didn't have experience with Membase. They didn't know how to support it. It didn't, other than installing it, we would have to spend who knows how long figuring it out and configuring it and what's the right way to do it. And then, well, there's a Membase provided server template from uh, in the RightScale multi-cloud marketplace. We're like, okay, cool, let's start off with that. And we're able to very quickly give this to the dev team 
And rather than blocking them, waiting for a while for people to figure out how to configure Membase and how to provision servers with it and how to set it up, is here you go. You can go ahead and use these, and then we'll catch up to you. We'll figure things out. Let us know what you're learning. Let us know what works and what doesn't work. And that sort of flows into creating your custom your custom built server templates for things that don't necessarily exist in the multi-cloud marketplace. So uh, an example of that at the time was MongoDB. Um, there was no MongoDB server template in the multi-cloud marketplace, so my team spent a fair bit of time with Tengen understanding what are the right Mongo architectures, what are the architectures that work very well for web-based games, and then wrote those server templates. And what we ended up with was for Couchbase, Membase aside, and Mongo, and Cassandra, well, those are the, those are the flavors of NoSQL database servers we're able to offer to development teams. And if they wanted to use PHP apps, if they wanted to use uh, Rails app servers, or if they wanted to use Node, those were server templates that we either pulled out of the marketplace or wrote ourselves and were offered to development teams so that any time they wanted to experiment with something different, if it was at the beginning of a, of a, of a game's lifetime, right, They'd, or the game's inception, they're just figuring things out. So, well, you have, this, you have these, these templates, you have these configurations available to you. Use them and don't worry about anybody in ops saying, you know, after two months of development coming around and slapping you on the wrist and saying, oh, you really shouldn't have used that and admonishing somebody for having used something because an operations team hasn't caught up to speed. So it's a very safe way of, of providing that. Um, there are a couple other examples, but I won't really uh, uh, get into those. So uh, highly available reference architectures, and this is also, you know, we, have, we have a lot of these. Uh, when I started preparing for this presentation, I started speaking to people in our professional services team. And I asked them, I said, well, we have a lot of gaming customers. We have a lot of customers in mobile and social and you know, even console gaming. Um, we have this thing called end-to-end uh, -end professional services engagement where you engage with our professional services team. They'll look at what you're trying to build and they'll uh, design an architecture with you that fits your needs. So I asked the question, I said, how often do you do these for our gaming customers to our, one of our main um, professional services architects, this guy, uh, Brian Adler, he said, I've never not done them. It's always happened. We always do this. I said, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. Why, why is that? He said, well, it's a couple different situations. And I was like, well, huh. what he ended up telling me is exactly what I'd experienced. It's a couple different situations. You have smaller, smaller gaming companies who, again, don't necessarily want to spend don't want to spend the time and the resources on infrastructure engineering. So use these services engagements to sort of like boost their initial level of knowledge to a point where they're comfortable. Or if it's in a larger organization, simply don't have that, don't have that knowledge and need that boost. So it's either don't want to spend it or don't have that knowledge. One way or another, you end up getting it. And interestingly enough, I thought about the experiences I went through. I was like, oh, well, that's, that was exactly, <laughs> that was exactly what, what I went through uh, several years ago. Now, what you end up with it may differ from your, may differ from the, the sort of this, this initial deployment and that comes with experience and so on. Uh, and I'll circle back to, I'll circle back to how things sort of change um, over time. Uh, this is an area that I wish I knew more about. If I can go back in time to when I started deploying infrastructure in the cloud, um, I wish that I'd known more about this. I wish that I had known about tools that were available and didn't try and figure this stuff out for myself and spend a lot of time getting a lot better with Excel than I'd ever intended to become in my life, because that's what happened. Um, so where the where this sort of cost information, planning information is essential for maintaining your focus is if you go about launching infrastructure and resources and you're not really considering what are my costs going to be and you're not really considering how are you going to monitor those costs, it becomes a tremendously large distraction, 
right? That's going to pull your time away from doing what is more important, right? What's really important is you spend time with your with developers, you spend time with producers understanding what is trying what are you trying to build? How are you going to monetize this game? How can you know, ar architecture and operations help in making these games more successful. Not having an idea as to what your costs are, what, the, sorry, what, the, what your costs are going to be, makes it a lot, a lot more difficult to actually get any form of approval for launching any of this infrastructure. And then once you do it, you can go ahead and you could launch infrastructure without any kind of approval. It's not that difficult to do. But, Monitoring those costs and understanding what those costs are on a regular basis, if you're not really keeping an eye on them and you're not able to understand where you're going with your costs, well, a couple things could happen. This is what I've seen happen several times. One, somebody wisens up to a lot of money being spent and then you have to go and spend a lot of time digging back through their infrastructure history to understand what was spent. What, what do we build? What, in, what instances do we use? Why do we choose these instances versus another one? Why are the costs as high as they are? And it takes a lot of time and energy and effort. It's a bit of a distraction to an extent. You may run through more money than you're expecting to spend, right? So you may end up burning through a significantly large portion of your either development costs or your, or your infrastructure operations costs. And I've actually seen this happen only once, which is unfortunate, but the development, development budget was exhausted because costs were not being monitored correctly or accurately enough. And that dev team had to be had to get so they had to scale back on what they were doing, which is unfortunate because they had something pretty interesting working. And then they were eventually able to get back into development a little bit later on. But there are some pretty serious cost implications to not monitoring their costs properly. Ultimately, though, is if it's like I was saying, is that if you're not trying to if you're not putting effort into forecasting your costs properly and you're not monitoring those costs properly. It's going to end up being a pretty large uh, and tremendous distraction for you. Um, excuse me. Sorry. Um, so going back to those, you know, those highly available reference architectures. Um, yeah, if you're if it's in a smaller environment where you choose not to invest a lot in your infrastructure uh, in, in infrastructure um, expertise and you're using you're using services to help offset that knowledge or to help boost that knowledge, things change over time. Your needs will change over time. What you have deployed may not necessarily be what you intended it to be, and it's not as if you know you're not you don't know what you're deploying. But trends change, technologies change, and depending on what your your available resources are, you may not necessarily be using what you intended on using, or your needs may change over time. This is something that I'd wish I'd known about. Um, so it's kind of a trend here, right? It's like things that were available. <laughs> and going into things that were not available or that I didn't even know about. <laughs> um, I had learned about this when I was, again, speaking with our professional services team. They said, well, what do you do once you, you do these, these reference architectures and you build them, you work with customers and so on, you get them up off the ground, and what do you do with it next? So, well, we'll go back after six months or after a year's time and re-engage with these groups and understand what's, what's changed, how have, their, how have their needs changed, how have their... How have their their infrastructure requirements changed over time. And so this thing is the deployment review process. I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, what it's evolved into is sitting down with people, sitting down with customers and understanding what are you actually running? Uh, can you scale back on some of your costs? Are you still deploying your infrastructure in the most effective way possible? Are you still are you still running your infrastructure in a way that's most effective or beneficial to uh, to your business? And the presumption here isn't that you're isn't that you're not, but can you get more out of it than what you currently have have now? And again, this is very applicable for some of the, for, for for both smaller and larger groups where you have um, you may you may have lost some of that focus either on 
your infrastructure and it's sort of just it's just chugging along and that's okay, but it may not be doing what it's supposed to be doing or it may not be working at its most optimal level or you may have you may have chosen to not spend as much time there and you're spending your time where you should be with your with with developers and whatnot, but you still do need to come back and think about what is happening within those deployments and what's happening with your infrastructure to make sure that it maintains a healthy state. Um, so those are some of the ways within, uh, some, of the, some of the experience I've had, some of the ways within the right scale. And um, I did choose to keep this uh, conversation or this talk as short as possible because I'm uh, barely able to maintain a consistent train of thought. Uh, I do. I do apologize for the so the, the brevity of this of the of the presentation. Um, I'll turn to any questions uh, that are more specific to your environments, uh, to your experiences, and if there's any inf if there's any uh, information or knowledge I can share with you about what I've done in the past and what you're experiencing, I'd like to take it there, uh, and a little less just about me talking. I'd like to hear what you've been, what you've been doing and what your, some of the challenges are that you're seeing. Yes? I just have a general question. Since the topic for your session is using the cloud for mobile, social, and games. Yes. So I was like <laughs> looking forward to hearing more about, you know, like do you see a lot of like gaming, social, mobile applications running on cloud today. I don't see a lot of those, and I think there might be some technical challenges today. Can you, Certainly. I mean, can you just cover them? Yes, yes. absolutely. So um, using infrastructure as a service is, in my opinion, the most appropriate infrastructure solution for uh, Social games, web-based games, mobile applications, applications or products that can have a admittedly short lifespan. Right? Uh, it's not every mobile application, it's not every mobile game that is going to be an Angry Birds billion dollar long-term success. Right? Everybody wants to build that, but it, they're not all going to get there. And there are, it takes a lot of iteration and cycles until a game development team or a company actually gets to that point of success. So there's going to be a lot of failures that happen before you get to that point. Using infrastructure as a service is a tremendously appropriate solution for that because you're, you don't need to worry about the upfront infrastructure costs of hosting applications or hosting your, your, back, -end, your back end infrastructure, your back end um, platforms for whatever mobile app or game or social game or web-based game, whatever it may be, you're able to use what's appropriate for you at the time, iterate on things very quickly. If it's not working or if your game isn't a success or if your application isn't getting the traction that you're expecting, well, you can very easily scrap what's been done. You're not stuck with having invested in, in any kind of infrastructure, you can also iterate on the actual technology that you're using. So if the development platform or the development frameworks that you're using isn't the right one or it doesn't gain you enough traction, you're not able to, to iterate on ideas quickly enough and you decide to shift or pivot to something else, you have a lot more flexibility with infrastructure as a service or with cloud computing as you would as opposed to in a traditional hosting environment. So um, I am absolutely of the belief that it is the most appropriate uh, infrastructure as a service. Cloud computing is by far the most appropriate way to host uh, your backend infrastructure for mobile games, social games, mobile applications. Um, get into console games, there are use cases where uh, traditional hardware is very appropriate and depends on workloads. Uh, but to your specific question, yeah, we see a lot of that. Um, the largest uh, Zynga is a is a large right scale customer. Uh, they have you can probably make the argument that one of the largest um, private clouds in the world. It's powered. Their cloud management platform is right scale. They use uh, AWS to launch games and then migrate them in house once they hit a certain peak point. 
Um, we have many, 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 many gaming customers. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's a very uh, consistent, uh, consistent part of our customer base as well. Yeah. Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah. Oh, could you repeat? Uh, so, the, oh yeah. So the question is, uh, are there performance issues with um, with with hosting games in the cloud? Uh, you'll encounter the same performance issues regardless of where you host your applications. Right? If you're not spending enough time thinking about how, about database scalability or database performance or um, performance of load balancers, app servers, and stuff like that, per actual code performance. If you're not uh, stress testing and load testing applications or code drops before they're being released to understand what's changed in unit testing and stuff like that. It doesn't matter where you host or how you host your games or your, or your apps. If you're, not, if you're not thinking about that stuff, chances, you, may, you may luck your way into success, but it's not going to be planned and thoughtful and so on. What you, one of the benefits uh, with hosting in the cloud is that you can easily throw infrastructure at the problem, which you can't do in a traditional hosting environment, which uh, I could share a not so good anecdote about throwing a lot of money at a problem with infrastructure that would be impossible to do in a traditional hosting environment, right? So you have, your, your access to resources are limited by what the provider can provide you, and in the case of AWS, in most cases, it's more money than you're probably comfortable ever spending, or more money than you ever want to spend. So you can kind of throw money or infrastructure at a problem, at a database issue, at an app server issue, so you can keep on scaling it out as much as you need, and then figure out what the problem was afterwards without actually impacting the availability or the performance of your applications. It's really, really, really difficult to do that in a traditional hosting environment. Even with, um, you know, some of our, even with some of our partners, it's hard to just have racks of hardware available. It's super expensive. Um, you don't necessarily have that problem with cloud computing. Um, how you configure your stuff is up to you, and that's why some of the we have a lot of best practices on how to configure things effectively. Uh, but you need to put that thought into it. Yeah. So, uh, do you normally see any challenges when your customer are ready to move? And migrate right from the public cloud back to the private cloud, and what sort of thing they need to look out for? Um, migrating from public to private, um, it depends on what kind of a migration you're trying to do. If um, it, I mean, take for example, if I'm a game developer, right? So my game now is very successful, right? And mm -hmm. I think I like my model is I would like to move back to my own, you know, private cloud, mm -hmm. and I think I believe that um, the asset, right, the artifact they build using right scale, right, to provision mm -hmm. to public cloud, should be highly reusable, right, to deploy, right, um, the same workload within the private cloud. I'm just asking if um, you know, do you see any challenges when they're moving and migrating back to a private cloud? And also, what sort of thing they need to look out for when they're doing such migration? Sure. Uh, a couple things. I'll answer the, the second question first. So a couple things that are uh, essential to look out for is uh, comparable performance. So um, the, the instances that you define in a private cloud are not necessarily going to be the same instances that are available in your public cloud. Right? So, you know, you're... Um, your AWS EC2 M1 large with the EC2 compute units and the abstraction that is to actual processors and gigahertz and then memory and the underlying hardware is not necessarily going to be the same thing that you have in your private cloud, right? And you can also, in your private cloud, you can also have access to resources that you may or you have different options. Right. You have options with disk persistency on servers, on instances. You have options of accessing incredibly high I.O., low, disk, low latency disks right, through, through SSDs. And how you, how you actually 
define those instance types is something to consider before moving so that you're getting either a comparable performance or an improved performance or a lower level, lower level of performance, but it's something that you need to keep in mind or take into consideration. Moving an application from a private cloud to a public cloud, uh, sorry, pub public, public to private, <laughs> public to private, excuse me. Um, how you migrate user data is uh, the most challenging aspect of it. That's uh, something that I've seen happen uh, not so smoothly. Uh, I've, I've not personally had conversations with, uh, with some of our development customers, our game development customers, as to how they've actually executed on that. From my own experience, uh, I've only seen it done successfully using Mongo replica sets in different, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a migration from public to private, it was actually a migration of regions, of AWS regions, which is kind of similar. You have a lot of the, you have the same data migration challenges, and the only way I'd seen that done successfully is actually moving Mongo replica sets into another region, paying for the data transfer costs, and slowly moving data over, and just basically weaning users off. The app servers, load balancers, that stuff is relatively easy, right? The configuration using server templates, that stuff is easy, so to speak. Uh, but moving your data is the challenge, and moving your data without impacting users is the tr is is tricky, but it is it is attainable. Uh, we can follow up offline. If we can follow up offline, I can certainly find out from some of our partners how, or some of our customers, how they've done that successfully, and definitely uh, get you some more information about that. Yes. So, uh, just, <clears throat> excuse me, just a, fo a follow on. So, what about in a hybrid environment? You know, so assume that you can actually spread your app across the private and public cloud. You know, did, did, you, did you guys do that when you were at Ubisoft? Did you see customers doing that today? And, and how, what, what do they, how do they make that decision? Um, so it was a decision that I'd thought through. I never, I never actually did that. And I am still in touch with some of my old colleagues there. And um, it was never actually executed on simply because it was too hard. With for a game, it was too hard to do that. Um, for mobile, for social and web-based games, for PC games, I have seen what I have seen is using different cloud providers, where effectively you have a shard of a game, so all of the components of a game, game servers, database servers, etc., that users connect to in a specific region. So using multiple cloud providers with Global with global services hosted in one location, so that'd be like your you know your user base and your uh, your inventory and your clan management system and those types of things. Those are more global services, but the actual game servers and the associated database servers would be used in different different with different providers in different regions, depending on where the game was more popular, or if we wanted to, or if it was if the game client was really hot, was was subject to uh, latency to was not um, would not perform well under high latency, so it'd have to move uh, game servers and database servers closer to users. Um, I within gaming, I off the top of my head, I can't think of um, customers that I know of that actually run geographically distributed infrastructure for the same game, but I will. Definitely look into that and see if there are some if there are some examples of how that has been done successfully. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Any more uh, questions? All right. Uh, again, my apologies for the brevity of the of the presentation. Um, more than happy to dig into any subjects or any other questions and stuff like that offline a little bit further. Uh, otherwise, thank you for thank you for attending and thank you for uh, joining us at the at our conference. <laughs>